All right, let's cut straight to it. When that patient rolls into the ER with a mangled hand, you know the clock is ticking. You're trying to rapidly assess the damage, make precise decisions that will directly impact their future function, and uh, every choice from initial assessment to post-op care feels critical. It's a high stakes game and staying on top of the latest evidence isn't just a good idea, it's essential for anyone practicing plastics in practice. Our mission today for you whether you're a resident scrubbing in or an attending refining your approach, is to hand you the practical, actionable nuggets from recent research on tackling vascular challenges and digital injuries. Think of it as um, your shortcut to those game-changing clinical pearls. Exactly. And to unpack these critical updates, we're diving into two distinct but equally vital areas. First, we'll explore how to objectively pinpoint vascular injuries in the hand for smarter, quicker triage. Makes sense. Right. Then we're going to tackle the often debated nuanced world of anticoagulation after digital replantation. We've pulled two crucial studies that really form the backbone of our discussion, giving us some truly invaluable insights for your daily practice. Okay, let's set the scene. We've all been there, right? A patient comes in with hand trauma. Visible bleeding from a deep laceration is obvious, sure. But what about those crush injuries or maybe a closed degloving? Identifying vascular compromise can be surprisingly difficult. We often rely on a mix of, you know, gut instinct, experience, and subjective tests. But what if we had an objective, universally available tool that could bring clarity and confidence to that initial assessment? That's the crux of the problem, isn't it? As you said, visible arterial bleeding, sure, that's a clear red flag. But with crusher closed injuries, the vascular damage can be completely hidden. It's tricky. And the traditional subjective assessments we've leaned on, things like capillary refill or a simple pinprick test, they can be incredibly misleading. They might show some local stasis or um, a vacuum effect, falsely suggesting flow when there's significant damage. It's almost like a kinked garden hose that still has some water in it, you know. But definitely not adequate flow for the plants, or in our case, the tissue. This tricky diagnosis often leads to either unnecessary transfers to level eye trauma centers, which cost time and resources, or far worse, delayed treatment. For residents especially, understanding this challenge can drastically impact efficient patient triage and resource utilization on your watch. Which brings us to a really insightful study by Tara Badkar and colleagues from 2015, published in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Aptly titled, The Use of Pulse Oximetry for Objective Quantification of Vascular Injuries in the Hand. Unquote. Their goal was clear. Evaluate pulse oximetry, a tool we all have right there, as a standardized objective measure of vascular injuries and ischemia particularly for those patients where operative exploration might be on the table. And their methodology was quite straightforward and I think pretty effective. This was a prospective study involving 20 patients, which gave them 49 individual digit measurements. So decent numbers to start. These were patients presenting with various traumas, lacerating, penetrating, or crush injuries. Crucially, pulse oximetry readings were taken on both the injured digits and control digits, and the attending surgeon making the treatment decision was completely blinded to those readings. That's key. The definitive presence of a vascular injury, what they termed dysvascularity, was then confirmed intraoperatively by identifying, you know, transected or thrombosed arteries and, most importantly, a lack of distal flow. And the findings. Truly eye-opening, offering incredible clarity. They found a profound difference in pulse oximetry measurements between digits with ischemic injury that averaged 76%, with a confidence interval, a robust range, of 64 to 87%. Compare that to digits without ischemia, which averaged a healthy 98%, with a CI of 97 to 99%. That difference was highly significant, p-value less than 0 0.001, so very unlikely to be chance. Now, this is the part that could fundamentally change your ER routine. Get this. They discovered that if a digit registered at least 95% on the pulse oximeter, it never had an ischemic injury requiring intervention. That's a 100% negative predictive value. Think of the confidence that brings when you're making a call. Huge. Just huge for decision making. Conversely, all digits with a pulse oximetry value of 84% or lower definitively required operative vascular treatment, whether that was revascularization or unfortunately amputation. That's a 100% positive predictive value. Right. So clear indicators at both ends. Yeah. There was a bit of a gray zone between 84% and 92% where, okay, clinical judgment is still paramount. But those two clear cutoffs are truly golden for decision making. Absolutely. This study provides crucial, actionable insights for how we triage and manage patients in practice. For residents and attendings, pulse oximetry offers an objective data point that can significantly aid your initial triage decisions. Seriously, consider this.
It could potentially reduce unnecessary transfers of simple lacerations to level eye trauma centers, saving considerable costs, valuable resources, and patient anxiety. For example, knowing a digit is well vascularized based on objective pulse oximetry could mean the difference between an expensive airlift and a simpler, less resource-intensive ambulance transfer, ah. all without compromising care, which is the goal, right? Exactly. Better resources, better patient experience. It also standardizes communication. With objective pulse oximetry values, you have clear, quantifiable criteria for discussing potential disvascular injuries among your medical team. Whether you're referring a patient or just discussing a case on rounds, it makes things much clearer. So for residents, here are the pearls. A pulse ox reading of 95% or higher strongly suggests adequate flow. That's your green light, pretty much. Conversely, a reading of 84% or lower points definitively to vascular compromise, directly guiding your decision for urgent surgical exploration. Now, a critical caveat, and this is important for board prep and just, you know, knowing your anatomy, the thumb. The thumb has a significant dorsal contribution to its blood supply, specifically from the dorsal ulnar artery. Right, that robust collateral circulation. Exactly, and that can sometimes mask severe injury. The study actually found one case of complete radial and ulnar neurovascular bundle transection in a thumb with a 92% pulse oximetry reading. Wow, so even with near-normal SATs. Yeah, meaning pulse oximetry can be less reliable for this specific digit. So, always factor in the thumb's unique anatomy. Don't rely solely on the number for the thumb. That's a crucial distinction about the thumb's anatomy. A true clinical pearl right there. And of course, like any study, this one had its limitations. You know, patient heterogeneity, a relatively small sample size, and the potential for systemic hemodynamic or environmental influences. Though other research does suggest minimal impact on reliability with true vascular occlusion. But the core takeaways here for your daily practice are incredibly valuable, offering a simple objective metric in often ambiguous situations. So, okay, we've armed ourselves with better tools for initial assessment. That's great. But getting a diagnosis is only half the fight, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. The post-op phase is just as critical. Right. Once that critical replantation is complete, a new set of challenges emerges, particularly the persistent threat of vascular thrombosis. Failure rates can range anywhere from 7 to 29 percent, which means a lot of replants are still at risk, a significant number. This is where anticoagulation steps onto the stage, but the protocols for its use are, well, notoriously varied, often based more on tradition rather than hard evidence, wouldn't you say? And that variability, as you mentioned, is a real headache. Anticoagulation has been a mainstay in reconstructive surgery for decades. Yeah. Yet, despite unfractionated heparin, or UFH, being widely used to prevent arterial and venous thrombosis, precise guidelines for its use after digital replantation covering the type, the dose, specific indications, optimal timing, they are surprisingly unclear. Yeah. Still, it's not uncommon for microsurgeons to still rely heavily on anecdotal experience. You know, this is how we've always done it. Hmm which leads to a non-standardized practice, and that isn't ideal for patient care or, frankly, for resident education. So, to bring some much-needed clarity to this, we turn to the Nishijima et al. study from 2019, also in PRS, titled Appropriate Use of Intravenous Unfractionated Heparin After Digital Replantation, a randomized controlled trial involving three groups. Hmm. The explicit purpose of this study was to nail down the appropriate use of UFH as an anticoagulation agent after digital replantation, aiming to provide solid clinical recommendations, finally some solid data, hopefully. Yeah, and the study design was quite robust. A prospective, randomized, single-blind, three-arm, parallel group controlled clinical trial. Pretty high-level evidence. They enrolled 88 patients who had amounted to 101 fingers, all with complete digital amputations requiring both arterial and venous anastomosis. That's important. Patients were then randomized into three distinct groups for seven days. First, a control group that received no heparin. Second, a low-dose heparin group receiving 10,000 IU day. And third, a high-dose heparin group, which started at 15,000 IU day, with the dose then adjusted to achieve an APT of 1.5 to 2.5 times baseline. Importantly, all patients across all groups also received prostaglandin E1 and cefazolin, ensuring a baseline of standard care. Okay, let's really unpack those results regarding success and complications because this is where the conventional wisdom gets a significant shakeup. Overall, the study found no significant differences in the success proportion, total necrosis, partial necrosis, infection, or ischemia among the three groups. The overall success proportion was 84% in both the combined heparin group and the control group, p-value of 1.00 basically identical. Now, for many of us, the immediate reaction is, wait, what? But we always use heparin. What's the deeper story behind this finding? 
That's exactly the question this study forces to ask. It's a bit counterintuitive at first glance. The deeper story is in the stratification. While overall, routine use didn't show a difference. Here's where it gets truly interesting and clinically significant. When they look specifically at subjects aged 50 years or older. Ah, okay. The age factor. Precisely. The odds ratio of the heparin group compared to the control group for success was a significant 5.40. To put that in practical terms, for patients over 50, those receiving heparin were 5.4 times more likely to have a successful replantation. Wow, 5.4 times. That's substantial. It is. This is a powerful interaction between treatment and age, indicating age is a crucial factor in who truly benefits from heparin. As for complications, congestion was significantly higher in the heparin group compared to the control group. That makes sense with anticoagulation. It does. Most of these congestion cases, thankfully, improved with medicinal leeches. Old school, but effective. In terms of safety, they reported no significant adverse events like major hematoma or hemorrhage, which is good. However, the high-dose heparin group did show significant elevations in APTT, an average of 42.8 seconds compared to a 28.7 baseline. Expected, but needs monitoring and also elevated liver enzymes, AST at 48.2 and ALT at 49 OU liter at day 7 compared to controls. This highlights the systemic impact and, frankly, the monitoring burden of higher doses. That's a profound shift in perspective for daily practice. This means we shouldn't be blindly giving heparin to everyone, not a blanket approach. So what's the crucial so what for our surgical decision making and patient management? What do you take home from this? This is where the rubber meets the road. This study strongly suggests that routine, unfractionated heparin administration is actually not necessary for all digital replantation patients, especially in younger cohorts where the overall success rates didn't differ. This directly challenges a long-standing, often anecdotal practice in many centers. Okay, so reserve it. Exactly. Instead, UFH is considered effective and genuinely beneficial for patients aged 50 years or older. These patients are at a higher risk for replantation failure, often due to comorbidities or underlying atherosclerosis, right? So heparin becomes a targeted high-yield intervention where the benefit truly outweighs the risk. And regarding dosing, if UFH is used, the low-dose 10,000 IU day is clearly preferred. The high-dose group, despite strict APTT monitoring, did not show better outcomes and was associated with increased congestion and those elevated liver enzymes. More complications, more monitoring, no added benefit. Precisely. It has a significant burden for medical staff with additional monitoring and patient management without a clear clinical advantage. So when you do use heparin, be vigilant for complications like congestion and monitor liver function, AST, ALT, in addition to APTT, especially if you're pushed towards higher doses for some reason. For residents and those prepping for board exams, remember that age cutoff. For patients 50 and above, heparin can significantly improve success. Big takeaway. But for younger patients, routine UFH may introduce risk without a clear, statistically significant benefit shown in this trial. Also, nuance. While the study found no statistically significant difference for vein grafts, likely due to small numbers in that subgroup, many experienced surgeons still heparinize these patients. Right. Clinical judgment still plays a role there. It does. So be aware of that nuance in practice, even with this data. That's incredibly practical guidance, especially for a busy service. Really useful. And it's important to note the study's limitations, as always. It was single blind, single center, and was actually halted early due to organizational changes. So larger multi-center studies would certainly strengthen these findings further. Definitely. More data is always good. Also, the concurrent use of prostaglandin E1 might have masked some of heparin's singular effects, potentially. A confounding factor, perhaps. Well, we've taken a deep dive into two critical areas today, moving from the initial assessment of a hand injury right through to the intricate post-operative care of digital replantation. This knowledge empowers you, hopefully, to make more informed, evidence-based decisions, refining your practice, and ultimately enhancing patient outcomes. To summarize these key takeaways for your practice, pulse oximetry offers a powerful, objective tool to rapidly triage vascular injuries. Hmm. Remember those critical cutoff points, 95% or higher for adequate flow, giving you confidence, and 84% or lower, pointing to definitive compromise, guiding immediate action. Simple, effective. Right. This really improves patient care and optimizes resource allocation. Meanwhile, for post-replantation, unfractionated heparin isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. It's a targeted intervention, particularly beneficial for patients aged 50 and above. When used, the low dose of 10,000 IU day is preferred, 
while always keeping a close eye on potential complications like congestion and liver enzyme elevations. These aren't just academic points, they're direct upgrades to your clinical toolkit, things you can use tomorrow. Exactly, and this raises an important question for you to ponder in your daily practice, maybe discuss on rounds. Considering the clear targeted benefits for older patients shown here, what other patient-specific factors might influence our anticoagulation strategies beyond just age? Think comorbidities, smoking status, mechanism of injury. And how might future research continue to refine these precise protocols even further? Something to keep you thinking.